is good to uh, be together in the name of the Lord and worship Him. I'm kind of grateful that uh, over these last several weeks we've actually been going through the book of 1 Peter talking about what it means to suffer. God's given us a foundation on which to respond to our present, present circumstances. I am very grateful for Robin Vaughn and his leadership and his, his calm demeanor and the words that he shared with us through the column all in this morning. Yeah. I'm grateful for that. You know, scripturally, one of the books that we don't like to really look at very much is the book of Leviticus. Because it has a lot of laws and rules. And in the laws and rules were all about keeping God's people safe and pure. And within those laws and rules, there, there were actually a lot of medical reasons why somebody might be identified as being a threat to the nation, and they would isolate those people to protect the whole nation. But it wasn't just about physical sickness that God was wanting to protect his people from. He wanted to protect them from the contamination of worldliness. You know? So if we think in terms like that, we definitely have a, an epidemic or a pandemic, however it wants to be described. But there's a spiritual pandemic of sin in our world. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to be cautious of that. Now, at the same time, we're told to be in the world, but not of the world, right? So it's, it's a challenge. But we need to be cautious about the contaminants that we let into our lives, that we uh, go through some good hygiene, both spiritually and physically. So we're being told to wash our hands and, and clean surfaces. Can I recommend that we try to do that more and more in our spiritual walk, right? Mm -hmm. to, to wash ourselves and keep ourselves clean. Isn't that why we, in fact, we come to the Lord's table together to worship before Him? So it's really, it's, it, 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 it's so refreshing to really see people who have faith in Jesus Christ that no matter what comes our way, this too shall pass. And God is still God. And we will still stand before him and be welcomed into his kingdom. So that being said, we, uh, we're going to approach our message for this morning, which is in 1 Peter chapter 5. In fact, we're going to close out the, 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 this, this book this morning. In 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, we have a kind of a toolkit that God gives to us. Uh, several things that he, he, gives, he allows us to have it ask for us to have in our lives so it, it helps us in our walk with Him. Last week we, we spoke directly to, to the elders and, and asked them to be certain kinds of men who, in the midst of suffering and trial, would set an example of what it means to be strong and faithful and, and show us the way to get through. Today we start off in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, uh, in, in regards to submitting ourselves to the eldership. And it says here in verse, verse 5, You younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, it's kind of an interesting thing. The last, the last verse we looked at last week was that, that of the eldership and that they should take a stand and that they should lead the way, those kinds of things. And then Peter turns right around and he says, and you young men. Why did he pick on young men? So for just a moment, Jackson and Mark and Clay, you young men, pay attention. <laughs> He calls out young men because when we men are young, we think we're invincible. <laughs> how many, and, and you, please don't say what you did, but how many of you men who are a little older say anything over 20? Let's say 25 or 30. Did things when you were youthful that you realize now were rather foolish? <laughs> I did. You don't have enough hands, Dan. <laughs> when we're young men, 
Mark and Clay and Jackson. We think that we can do anything, and we think we're big boys. When my son was 13 years old, he came and told me that he was more mature than I am. <laughs> he might have been, I don't know. <laughs> no, he wasn't. But he thought he was, and that's what young men do, right? Young men think that, they, that they're smart and intelligent, they can do what anything, anything they want, and that life just is an opportunity. It's in those younger years that, that, that young men strive to do foolish things and they're, they, they're adventurous. There's a young man here that recently jumped off of a bridge like 750 feet tied to a rubber band, right? <laughs> His father behind him says, I would never do that. Because we start to grow and we start to mature. And so it says young men... Be subject to your elders. There's wisdom in having birthdays. <laughs> There's some growth and some learning that happens just by having experience and life behind us. But especially with, with those who serve in leadership, God is saying, listen to the elders. As young people or as a congregation, it's sometimes hard to put our faith and our trust in a person or in persons. But they've been called out by God to be in that place. And what happens in a young man's mind is that, they, that they're just as good as, just as smart as. And that's an element of pride. And that's a lot what we're going to talk about this morning. Because pride gets in our way from being humble. But pride gets in our way from really having healthy relationships. He says then after that, that all of you, not just the young men, but all of us in here, should clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. And that is such an essential piece. Every, I, I can tell by looking at that, that y'all that you spend a little bit of time getting ready before you come to church. You've spent some time in front of a mirror. You've chosen certain clothing that you want, you, that you want to wear and got yourself ready to come. The very last thing you should put on at home before you walk out the door to come here is humility. A proper understanding of who you are in Christ Jesus. Because it's the lack of humility and the, effort, the essence of pride in our lives that causes any friction among us. And it's Humility is not about putting on this attitude that I'm worthless or that I'm hopeless or that I'm, I don't have value. That's not humility. That's deprecation. That's destroying. Keep in mind who you are, right? You are the son or the daughter of the Father of Heaven, of the Creator of the universe. You are the one who He sent His Son to die on the cross of Calvary for. So you have great value. He just wants you to understand and for me to understand that with all that value, we are of equal value in the church. And he wants us to humbly serve one another. And where we run into conflict is where we've done something and we want recognition or, or, we've, uh, or we have an idea and we want everyone to pay attention to my idea. Because my idea is really good. Just trust me, ask me. But God wants us to be humble, to work together, to, to let it be about His kingdom and about who He is, and not about who we are. It goes on and then it says, because God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. If there's pride in us, it says God opposes that. He's opposing any kind of pride or pr proud atmosphere or, or, or personality within us. But if we humble ourselves before him, he will, in fact, give us grace. This quote comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. What does it really mean that God opposes the proud? Our, 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 our actions really are the foundation, the, the proof of whether we are humble or not. God
God wants us to think in terms of the life of Christ, his humility. There's no one greater than Jesus. Sinless, the Son of God, God himself. And yet he came to serve. He came to seek, to save the lost. And it was never about himself. It was always about the honor of the Father. As Robin shared in his meditation this morning, why did he come? Why did he die? Because it was all about obeying the Father, about loving us. So in verses 5 and 6, or I'm sorry, 6 and 7, Peter continues and he says this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you, that he may raise you up at the proper time. And then verse 7 says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Peter says, humble yourselves, and then as you look through that, this, the, these two verses, this one sentence. So there's a humble yourselves, and then there's a casting your cares upon the Lord, your anxiety upon the Lord. Those two fit together. They're, they're intertwined together. One of the obstacles that people have about trusting Jesus with their lives one of the obstacles that we have about laying our anxieties upon him is because we have pride in our lives. There's something within us that says, you can do this on your own. You don't have to turn that over to Jesus. In fact, there's sometimes a mentality that the more we turn to Jesus and, and the more we ask him to help us through life, the weaker we are. I would say it's quite the opposite. That the more we trust Jesus, the stronger we are. Philippians chapter 4, and verses 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to worry about the coronavirus. Pray that. Turn it over to the Lord. Trust Him in the matter. Well, 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 David, what if I end up getting the coronavirus? Trust Jesus to get me to help you get well. Well, what if, what if I don't survive the coronavirus? Trust Him to take you into His presence. In any one of those options, you win. You are the victor through Jesus Christ who conquered sin and death. So as you think about what is pride, let me just share a few things about pride. Pride is self-satisfaction. It's all about being self-sufficient, that I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody or anyone. I am a big boy and I can handle life. And sometimes we treat God the same way. It is about being self-reliant and not dependent on our Father in Heaven. Pride considers itself above instruction. It's an unteachable spirit. You can't tell me anything. I know all I need to know. It's unwilling to submit to others. Pride likes to take credit for what God has accomplished. Sometimes there's very simple things that go on and we fail to give God the glory or the credit for what he's doing and how he's working. Pride itself exalts itself in being praised. It likes to have attention to itself. It aspires to the place of God. Pride is the very central figure in why Satan raised himself up and lost his place in heaven. Pride is the essential point at which Adam and Eve reached and took hold of a fruit they were not supposed to. Because it's what they wanted, and not what God wanted. Pride imposes the existence of God. It refuses to put trust in God. And it is most often very anxious about what is still to come. Under that framework of what pride is, Peter says this. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. About how big 
our God is, how amazing our God is, and that there's nothing in all this world that our God cannot conquer. Oh, I know that some will say, well, if he's that big, why doesn't he just knock the coronavirus out of the, out of the world and just snatch it away and heal everybody? Because he did that with sin. He conquered sin. He conquered the, the curse of sin. You and I and all the people in this world, they don't have to die anymore and face eternal judgment or hell. They have the opportunity of eternal life and living in the presence of the Father. If I have to trade that for a healing of coronavirus, I take the first. I want the, I want the healing from sin. I want to know that when my life is over, I am not done. And I will stand in the land of glory with him. So Peter says this. If you trust Jesus, cast your anxieties on him. Lay it all at his feet. If this morning what's going on in our world is kind of confusing and you don't understand it and it does worry you, put it all in the hands of Jesus and just let him handle it. He will get you through this. Amen. He will get you through your life. Whatever your life brings to you, God will keep take you through that and help you to be victorious in this life. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 19, it says, Entrust your soul to the faithful creator. Entrust your soul to the depths of who you are Trust God with your life. Because our anxiety is on him, it means that we trust him. It means that we believe the promise that is found in this verse. It says, and he cares for you. At the bottom line, if we think that we have to handle life on our own, if we think that we're big boys and, and we can do all things and be self-reliant and not turn ourselves over to God, it really is doubting that God is who he says he is. It's doubting two things. It's doubting his power and it's doubting his love. Right? Think for a moment. And I, and I, I, I think I know you well enough. Do you know? Are you confident? That God loves you. And secondly, do you believe he has the power to get you through what life throws at you? Then trust him with it, whatever it is. Lay it down before him and say, Father, I can't, but you can. This is the opposite of pride. This is true humility. It's where our confidence tells us that God's mighty hand is capable of in our lives. You know, when life gets to be an upheaval and, we, and things start to happen around us and, and we begin to struggle and we, get to, we begin to suffer and anxiety begins to build it up in us, the natural human reaction is to buckle down and to get through it on our own. That's really a sinful tendency. It's inside of every one of us. Guys, it's not weak to depend on Jesus. You want to show your spouse, your wife, what it means to be a man? You want to show your children how to be strong? Let them see you on your knees turning to Jesus and trusting him with what you're going through. The next thing in the tool chest is this. Resist the devil. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You know, basically, Peter has just said, relax, chill for a moment, and trust Jesus. And then he says, wake up! The devil's around, prowling, looking for someone to devour. Relax, trust Jesus. But be alert, because there's somebody chasing after you. <coughs> the 
The reality is, is that when we trust Jesus with our lives, he has freed us from the bondage of sin and death. That in itself removes fear from us. Fear of judgment, fear of death, fear of separation. But he didn't do that so that we just go about living life casually and do whatever we want and to live in a life of sinfulness. He did it to mold us and to change us. You know, in times of trial, we are probably more vulnerable than any other time to our enemy. And so when you think about what that scripture says, it says that the devil's prowling around looking for whom he might, might devour. And we know, you, you know, we've all watched, you know, those of us that are over 40, we've watched Mutual of Omaha. <laughs> it was on every Sunday evening, right? If you're younger, you watch the Discovery Channel or the National Geographic Channel or something else, and you get these, these shows about animals, and, and you see the lions that are, that are out there. And they're watching this herd of gazelle. Let me ask, are you the guy in, in the, at home in the, in, the, in the recliner that says, go, lion, go, get them? Or are you the one that's saying, oh, please help the gazelle, save the babies? The lion... The lion's got to eat. <laughs> that lion crouches down, tries to hide and be as inconspicuous as possible. And he watches the herd and he looks for the one that's weak. Look around you folks. Look in this room. The devil's looking for the one of us that's weak, that's maybe full of pride. The one that he could stir up in, ang in anger or anguish between you and a brother or sister in the building. Satan wants to hurt the relationship. He wants to hurt the effects of what the congregation of the Caledonian Church of Christ is beginning to do and accomplish. And he's looking for the weakest among us to take you down. You who are strong, the scripture says, be strong, be faithful, and go stand along your brother who is weaker in the faith. And be the strength for them. You who are weaker, get rid of the pride and turn to the Lord and let Him be your strength. Participate in the fellowship because we are one in Christ. <clears throat> I don't want you to be confused about who Satan is. He is powerful, He is strong. He's an enemy we cannot see. But he is not equal to God. He is not omnipresent, nor is he omnipowerful. He has limitations. There's a real probability that none of us in this room have ever, ever stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with, the, with the actual Satan himself. But he's got many proxies, many demons that go out and work in his, on his behalf. You know, there's a, if you go to Christian bookstores, you'll find shelf after shelf about how to defeat demons. How to cast them out, how to do this, how to do that. Do you know what the Bible says here? It says, resist the devil. Resist the devil. But remember, it started with humble yourselves before God. Stand with God. Resist the devil. Live differently. Satan wants us to think that our sufferings are too big. They get in the way. He, he puts thoughts and ideas in our minds that we, we, we start to turn away from the Father. He is the accuser of the brethren, the scripture says. He is our adversary, one who stands opposed to us. He wants us to believe that God just treats people that way. He just treats people with trials and tribulations. God makes all these horrible things happen. You, why would you even follow God that serves and Teaches, treats his people with such disregard. That's a lie. Satan knows very well it was he in his path of sin that brought all this suffering upon us. And yet people blame God. Remember this. We must first bow before God so we can take a stand against and resist the enemy. Are you humble before the Father? And then it goes on in verse 10, it says, And God will do this, verse 10, 
After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. First of all, this verse says, after you suffer a little while. The word little, actually, in the original language, it doesn't look like it's true with the way that we read this, but that word little could refer to either the timing of our struggles, that they're short and brief, or that the intensity of the trial is not as great as we think. But either way, if it, the mindset is, is if you fake, if your trust is in Jesus, there's no trial, no matter how great, that is great enough to defeat you. <clears throat> Every trial is minor in the eyes of the Lord. He conquers everything. Amen. And if it's about the, the, the timing of trials, you know, when you're going through tri trials and, and, and you have anxiety, you know, parents, it's that moment that you're at home and, the, and your teenager has said that they're going to be home at a certain time and you're watching the clock. It's now 10 seconds after I last looked at my watch. When you're going through struggles and strife and you're filled with anxiety, time seems to stand still. And it seems longer in the midst of the suffering than it really is. But even your entire life, the Bible compares to a vapor that is here one moment and gone the next. In the face of eternity, your strife and struggles are minimal and brief. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart. But through our outer man, though our outer man is decaying, and yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not, are eternal. Maybe you're out of the boat right now and you're walking on water and the waves are crashing around you. Are your eyes on Jesus or the waves? So these things are temporary. He says finally that the, all the grace of all, the God of all grace, the one who called you into his eternal glory will be with you. And then he gives us four things that he's going to do for us. Let's take a look at those. It says first that he will perfect you. Now, there's two different words in the Greek language about the word perfect. One is about getting to the goal to the end, that at the very end, Christ will perfect you, finish you. He will finish the job in you. The other one is the idea that he is going to put things back together. The one that's used in this verse is the idea about putting things back together. It's as if you've broken a bone. And you go to the doctor, and the doctor resets the bone, right? That's this kind of per perfecting. It's fixing what is broken. Well, what's broken? Our relationship with God was what was broken. We were separated from Jesus. We were, we were thrown out of his presence. What was broken is, is our heart. What was broken is our relationships. What was broken is our bodies that become injured and hurt and diseased. Everything in the world is broken. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that all those who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is the fixer of the world. He's the healer. He's the one that can restore and put you back together. No matter what you're going through, no matter what struggle, if it's divorce, addiction, death, whatever you're facing, God can fix the brokenness. He will confirm you. The best example I can think of is to help us understand that what it means for him to confirm us. You remember in the Old Testament that uh, there's, a, there's a battle going on um, against the Amalekites, and whenever Moses' hands were in the air to the Lord, they won. But every time his, his arms got tired, he put his arms down, they started to lose. So they put Moses on a rock, and, and a guy by the name of Hur and Aaron, his brother, got on either side, and they held his hands up for him, so his hands would never go down. Guess what? They won. That idea of holding up and, 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 and firming up is what this word confirm means. 
When you're going through struggles, when you're going through strife, God is the one who's going to stand beside you. He's going to hold you up. He's going to confirm you. He's going to give you the ability to, to, to get through because he loves you that much. Strength. Strength is pretty straightforward. He will give you strength to bear all things, to endure all things. He will give us the strength to make it. We just have to choose to stay with him and not abandon him. And that's what was happening in 1 Peter. So many Christians were abandoning the faith and just giving up. And Peter saying, no, stay strong. Let God be your strength. You know, a life with no effort and with very little discipline almost inevitably ends up in a flabby life. If you need no other illustration, I can point fingers too, so you don't just be laughing at me. <laughs> be strong. We need the nourishment of God's Word. We need the exercise of Christian service, of getting the hands and the feet of Jesus moving to make the church healthy. I don't think we really truly understand what faith means until we take a step of faith and do something that would depend on His strength and be something beyond what I could do on my own. Lastly, he says, I will establish you. Peter says that God will establish you. This is about the foundation of your life. This is about the fundamentals of what you believe. This is about that God will take the core of your life, your very soul, and he will establish it on a good foundation. This is where we trust our lives to, to, to his word. It is the picture we see of the, of, the, of the house that is built on the solid rock. And when the winds and the waves and the storm came crashing against it, it did not fall. Versus the life that is built on sand. And when the storms come against a person who builds their life on something that's shaky or worldly or sandy, those waves just rock the foundation away and the house falls. This morning, if your house is not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, if your life hasn't been about Him, you, you've had the knowledge in, in the head that your life hasn't been based on that, we're going to ask you to make a decision to say yes to Jesus, to be the very foundation of your life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the scriptures talk about Jesus knocking at your door and saying, I want to get back in if you've been pushing Him away. If you've been relying on yourself and depending on yourself to get through, through life and you really haven't been serving Jesus, he says, I'm still knocking. Do you hear me knocking on your door? Let me back in. And then 1 Peter 5.11 says, to him be the dominion forever and ever. It's all about Jesus. We started with humility and we learned that it really is all about him. It's not about us. Well, there's some closing comments here, and I think that more than any other day that I could have stand here to give you this message, it is appropriate that I share this with you. This passage, this book is closed out with these words. Greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> All around us there's a virus. Now go out and greet each other with a big old kiss. <laughs> if you trust Jesus, you could, right? <laughs> well, let me say a little bit about that. First of all, in this one case, we really do look at this as being something cultural. And so you don't get all excited about this idea. This was men kissing men and women kissing women. It was simply a greeting, nothing more than what it an American handshake typically is. But Peter said, take this custom and tie it to love. 
So what I'm asking us to really do, I, I'm not asking you to kiss each other, but quite honestly, if one of you came up to do that to me, I'd probably flee. <laughs> Especially from some of you. <laughs> but here's the thing. Might there be a fellowship of the Spirit in this room? Let there be a dissipation of, of, of pride and a growth of humility between us so that when we come together, it's about Jesus. Let us truly put on the garment of humility when we come in here together. And that we wrap that, that we, when we greet each other, it's not just a hello, how are you, or those kinds of things. That it's something that's wrapped, as Peter asked the church here to do, in love. Love one another. I ask you, love one another. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this congregation of people who are devoted to loving you. Devoted to your word. There are some of us that are here this morning who have struggled with pride and humility. Work in us to change our hearts. There's some of us in here who have stopped trusting you or trying to do it on their own or even thinking about giving up on the church. You be their strength. You be the one to stand alongside them and lift them up. You be the one that establishes them on a firm foundation. You be the one who fixes their broken life. Thank you for Jesus. He is the answer for every life and every moment. In his name we pray, amen. Our hymn of decision is 491. If you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you need to surrender to him and repent and to be baptized in him this morning, we give you that opportunity. If you've been wandering in your you want to make Jesus the Lord again in your life or, or renew that vow to him, we invite you to come and to pray. The elders will pray with you, I'll pray with you, the congregation.